live on Earth. And as much as we want to be, we're not the center of attention in the universe. Instead, about the 1600s it took us until then to realize that everything in the solar system doesn't orbit us. We, along with Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all orbit the Sun, an average-sized yellow star. This includes the dwarf planets, like Pluto and Eris, and the debris, like comets and asteroids. People have been studying the planets ever since they first looked up at the sky. However, it took a long time for these studies to truly tell us our place in the universe, including the fact that the sun is still not at the center of everything. We know now that there are numerous planetary systems out there, orbiting stars that, like our sun, are all part of our galaxy the Milky Way. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. That means it has a bright central region of stars surrounded by a flat disk of stars, gas, and dust. It's called a spiral galaxy because this, this flat disk of stars, gas, and dust resembles spiraling arms. And it turns out that our sun is about halfway between the center and the edge. Now, for a while, we thought that our galaxy was all there was to the universe. Just as recently as the 1920s, though, we found out that there were billions of other galaxies out there in space, much like our own. After a lot of controversy, Edwin Hubble was able to take these objects that were unknown and realize that the distance to them was actually larger than the size of our galaxy. Therefore, they had to be outside of our own galaxy. And the universe became a much bigger place. He even found some that looked like ours with the same central and disk structures. He also realized that they are not moving randomly through space. Instead, they have a very specific behavior. Hubble was able to take his distance information and pair it with Vesto Slipher's velocity data for each galaxy. What he found was that, as we looked at them from Earth, every galaxy was pretty much moving away from us. And the ones that were moving away, the ones that were further away, were moving away more quickly. The ones that were closer were moving away more slowly. However, this might imply that we're at the center of everything if everything is moving away from us. But that can't really be true. So what if we looked at another galaxy from the perspective of a different galaxy? We'd see the same thing. The galaxies are all moving away from that galaxy, and the ones that are further away are moving away more quickly. The ones that are closer are moving away more slowly. But how could this be? 
The galaxies themselves can't be doing this as they move through space. This does make sense, though, if it's the space between the galaxies that's actually expanding with time. So the space between the galaxies is carrying the galaxies away. The galaxies, the galaxies are just hitching a ride on this expansion. It's kind of like the raisins in a loaf of raisin bread, that when you bake that bread, the distance between each raisin gets bigger because the space between them, the loaves, the, the, the dough, gets bigger. So if this expansion is happening that we observed, it must have been doing so for a very long time. So what does that mean for the history of the universe? Well, let's reverse the clock. So if you look at the universe shrinking instead of expanding, the galaxies get closer and closer and closer together until everything is on top of everything else. And you can't actually ask, where is this point? Because everything in the universe, all the galaxies and all the space, is all at that one point. And so the center of the universe is everywhere, is all in that one point. Or nowhere is the center of the universe. So it turns out that we're just as special as every other place in the universe. Now, the galaxies themselves can't actually exist as galaxies as you reverse the clock like this. Because as everything gets denser and denser, everything also gets hotter and hotter. Until you can't have matter, you just have energy. And in fact, 13.7 billion years ago, 13.7 billion years ago, it was a writhing, seething mess of energy. See, the, this idea of the expansion caused the idea of the Big Bang, which started off as a joke, by the way, but that term stuck around. See, the Big Bang is not an explosion. It's an expansion. In fact, it's the initial point of expansion, the time when you can start the clock, when the universe itself finally comes into being, and so time actually makes sense. Now, we don't have any theory of physics to describe what happens at this point in the universe, at these high densities and high temperatures. But what we do know is that the four fundamental physical forces of the universe should be indistinguishable. And combined colloquially, we call them a theory of everything. A theory that will get someone a Nobel Prize someday. See, the gravitational, electromagnetic, and strong and weak nuclear forces at these energies, because they're so high, should be indistinguishable. You can't tell one from the other. But today, they are separate. And what happens is that the universe, from the point of the Big Bang, keeps expanding and cooling. So these high temperatures are not maintained. And the first force to split off from this is the force of gravity. The gravitational force concerns anything that has mass or energy, but it is the weakest force by far. The three remaining forces are all described by some version of quantum mechanics, and we call them together a grand unified theory, or a gut. That's also a theory that will get someone a Nobel Prize someday. Now, the universe is still expanding and cooling. And so there's another force to split off. The next force is the strong nuclear force, which governs how atomic particles uh, interact in nuclei. Cosmologists believe that when it did so, it caused a tremendous brief increase in the expansion rate called inflation. And the universe became a vastly larger place, and we inhabit only a tiny part of that. And the universe is still cooling at this point. And quickly after this, the electromagnetic force, which governs particles with electric charge and magnetic properties, will split off from the weak nuclear force, which governs how particles decay especially when a light particle called a neutrino is involved. Now, by the way, the Nobel Prize for this was gotten in 1979, and it's called the electroweak theory. Now, all of this flurry of activity takes place in just the first trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 12. During this time, the universe is flooded with energy, and that energy is turning into particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter. And when a particle finds another antiparticle, they turn back into energy. Two particles or two antiparticles will just bounce off of each other. Now, Einstein tells us 
that E equals MC squared. <laughs> and so that tells us how much mass we get or how much energy we have. Technically, this energy is in the form of photons, little bundles of light that take energy from place to place. Now, again, during this whole time, the universe is expanding and cooling. You might notice the theme here. All of these stages in the universe, all these different points are happening because the universe keeps expanding and cooling. The photons, therefore, because their measurement of the energy of the universe, keep on losing energy. Somehow, though, about one billion and one, ant、uh, one billion and one particles must have been made for every one billion antiparticles, or there would be no matter in the universe because all of it would have annihilated. And the energy of the universe, since it's dropping, wouldn't be high enough to make it again. See, just, because, just like E equals mc squared says, the mass of the created particle can only be as large as the corresponding energy. And as the temperature of the universe goes down, that energy goes down. And so only lighter and lighter particles can be made. And so after a while, the particle numbers are set. So one second after the Big Bang, We have a ratio of one neutron, which has zero charge, to every five protons, which has a positive charge. At this point, the strong nuclear force would love to bind these particles together into larger nuclei, but the photons in the universe have other plans. <laughs> Remember, these photons are traveling bundles of energy. One neutron plus one proton is called deuterium. It's an isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen itself. Is just one proton. So these interactions are happening. The photons are preventing this weak bonded neutron and proton from coming together, but the photons themselves are losing energy because the universe is expanding and it's cooling, and so they have a harder time preventing these from coming together until eventually they're too weak to break the neutrons and protons apart. At that point, deuterium is stable. And that happens two minutes after the Big Bang. Now, once deuterium is stable, you can combine those into larger particles, specifically helium-4, which has two protons and two neutrons. Now, you also have to make sure you overcome the positive repulsion of the proton and proton. But the energy of the universe is right for this. You also could ask, well, there's plenty of protons around. Why can't you make any more? And the answer is the energy isn't right for that. So you could try to make lithium, beryllium, and boron, the next elements in the chain beyond helium, but you can't do that because the energy isn't right. Technically, you make a tiny, negligible amount of lithium, beryllium, and boron. So four minutes after the Big Bang, there's 75% of the regular matter in hydrogen and 25% of the regular matter in helium, with a tiny, negligible amount. Of lithium, beryllium, and boron. You might ask, where's the rest of the matter? Because we're made of elements beyond those. Well, it turns out that stars make those elements. They're basically big element factories using nuclear fusion.、Okay. Now the photons are still around. They're still interacting with all of these charged particles. Okay, but they, they would really like to just stream out through space, but they can't. Because they have to keep on interacting with the charged particles. We also can't forget about the electrons. We don't just have these positively charged nuclei; we have negatively charged electrons that are around. And in fact, we have enough electrons to actually balance the positive protons out there in the universe. But what are the photons doing? The photons have enough energy to break these apart, to prevent the electrons from actually combining with these positively charged nuclei. But guess what? What's the universe doing? It's expanding, and it's cooling, and so the photons keep losing energy. They get weaker and weaker until they can't actually break this bond. The electrons can finally actually combine with the nuclei to make neutral atoms. This also means the photons can freely stream through space because there are no free charged particles to actually hinder them. Now. Once you end up having these stable neutral atoms together, you can start clumping them into larger structures due to gravity. And so, one billion years after the Big Bang, 
you can start making stars and galaxies. And as you fast forward the clock even more, you get to 13.7 billion years, which is today. And as far as we know, and from what we understand, that 13.7 billion years for, of expansion will keep on going. There will be more and more expansion. Thank you.